Good afternoon, students. Welcome to EBS 357, Introduction to Atomic Phases, Heat and Optics. Um, in our last lecture, we tried to look at the model of the atom as proposed by most of the renowned scientists whose names we mentioned. We went through uh, scientists like Prowse. We also looked at the atom. We came up with Rutherford's experiments and also moved on to look at what J.J. Thompson did. Along the line, we also mentioned people like Eugene Goldstein and Chadwick, whose contribution actually helped in identifying particles in the atom, such as the neutron and then the proton. In today's lesson, we are going to look at one other renowned scientist who has also contributed to the model of the atom that we have today. In fact, this scientist by name, Le Bohr, was a student of Ernest Rutherford. And so, we want to look at what Ernest Rutherford taught Le Bohr. Now, the objectives for this lesson, the objective for the lesson, include the fact that at the end of this lesson, you should be able to state the assumptions of Nebo's model of the atom. Number two, you should be able to draw the Nebo's model of the atom. And when you draw, you should also be able to label the parts as well. You should be able to state the limitations of the Nebo model of the atom whilst comparing it to the other scientists whose model of the atom we have talked about. Now let's start. Like I said, Nebor was actually a student of Rutherford. In 1913, as said, by a slide, one of the Rutherford students, Nebor, proposed a model for a hydrogen atom that was consistent with Rutherford's model, yet also explained the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. When we talk about spectrum, it's, you know, <clears throat> a shade of colors. Thus, every atom is associated with some shades of colors or series of colors. And so for hydrogen, Nebor was able to explain the spectrum of colors in hydrogen using his experiment. Now he proposed this model of the atom, which looks like the solar system. What do we mean by the solar system? We know that the solar system has its central parts being the sun, and this sun is surrounded by a number of planets. Okay, a number of planets. So if this is the sun, the planets are supposed to be orbiting the sun in this manner. And so Nebor likened his atom to this system, naming the sun as the nucleus of the atom. <clears throat> and then the planets, he proposed that they are supposed to be the electrons moving in these shells or orbits. So on our slide, we see the boss model of the atom, where we have the central part, and in the central part, we can have protons and neutrons, and around this central part, which is the nucleus, 
we find the electrons moving in their orbits. Now, for a hydrogen atom, if we want to consider Lebos atom, then hydrogen atom will come in this form, the nucleus, where we could put, let's say, the proton P and perhaps a neutron. And around this, we have, you know, an electron moving around the orbit of the atom. <clears throat> now, these shells have been labeled. And the labeling starts from the inner shell, where if this is shell number one, so we say n is equal to one, we have n equals two, and if I have a third one, then I may call it n equals three, and so on and so forth. So, the ball, the atom, actually depicts the structure of the solar system where we have the planets moving around the sun. Now, he made some assumptions in his proposal. The ball made a number of assumptions, at least we know about six of these proposals, and we're going to go through one by one. His first assumption was that the electron in the hydrogen atom travels around the nucleus in a circular orbit. So as I have shown on this board, if we have the nucleus, which contains the protons and then the neutrons. And this is the shell, which is the orbit. Then an electron here is supposed to be moving in a circular orbit. Number two of his assumptions is that the energy of the electron in an orbit is proportional to its distance from the nucleus. The further the electron is from the nucleus, the more energy it has. This is a mathematical statement which we can put into writing by saying that if we let E represent the energy of the electron, then the above is saying that E is proportional to 1 over maybe r being the distance and that's once the distance is far away from the nucleus we have more energy this is simple you can even look at the relation that a small distance from the nucleus will give you you know how you get uh, more energy and so on and so forth say so the energy of electron in an orbit is proportional to its distance is proportional, not inversely proportional. So let's look at it. Proportional meaning it's this way. Okay, so when this one increases, this one will increase. When this one decreases, this will decrease. And that is what Nebel is saying. Can we make progress? The third one says that only a limited number of orbits with certain energies are allowed in that atom. That means that, in other words, the orbits are quantized. Okay, they have been assigned some discrete numbers. The fourth assumption by Nebel is that the only orbits that are allowed are those for which the angular momentum of the electron is an integral multiple of the Planck's constant divided by two. So. For the fourth assumption, we can all look at it from the perspective of the fact that when the angular momentum, you know, linear momentum, momentum is supposed to be the mass of the particle and its velocity. 
we are looking at angular momentum and this will be the linear momentum multiplied by the radius of the circle in which the electron is moving. So the above number four of the assumptions is telling us that this M V R is the same as the integral multiples of the Planck's constant. Planck's constant is H divided by 2. And we'll put here a certain constant, which is the pi that we know of. So that the fourth assumption simply tells us that there are allowed values for the angular momentum. Now let's go to assumption number five. The ball is telling us that given the atom, if, for instance, this is the nucleus of the atom, and then there are so many shells around or orbits around this atom, when an electron should fall from a higher energy level, okay, if it is here and it falls to let's say this energy level, it will release some energy. It will emit energy. So when you fall from, yeah, so like we said, the assumptions were six. And so the sixth one, according to Nebor, is that the energy of the light emitted or absorbed is exactly equal to the difference between the energies of the orbits. And so if we consider our diagram again, where well, we have this as the nucleus, then if this is the first shell, the second shell, the third shell, let's give ourselves only three shells. So then this is shell number one, so n equals one. Shell number two, n equals two. Shell number three, n equals three. And all these shells or these orbits are associated with energy. The boss sixth assumption is that the energy of the light emitted or absorbed is exactly equal to the difference between the energies of the orbit. So we now want to say that orbit number three is linked with energy number three. Orbit number two is also linked with energy number two and orbit number one, energy number one. So assuming there is an electron here, and that electron falls from n equals 3 to n equals 1. We have n equals 3 to be equal to the initial destination, and then n equals 1 to be the final destination. So the difference in energy is going to be the n final, which is supposed to be the E1 minus the n initial, and that is E3. And Nebo's sixth assumption is that this E1 minus E3 is supposed to be equal to the energy difference between the two energy levels. So it's straightforward. You just have to first identify where the electron is and where it is going to. Then you can tell the difference between 
the two energy levels. Now, of the six assumptions, three of them are of very much importance to us. Three of the assumptions are very, very important to us. And so we want to look at these three assumptions and based on that, we want to find out how Nebo actually dealt with these three assumptions. Now the first one is that Bohr recognized that his first assumption violates the principle of classical mechanics. And let me take time to explain what we mean here. In the physics world, we talk about classical and quantum. Okay? So are classical and quantum. The classical physics deals with macro structures or macro materials or substances. Macro means bigger. Okay? So looking at movement of cars movement of let's say aeroplanes movement of bicycles trains and motorbikes and other particles that we can think about maybe football tennis ball and all those things they are macro and faces describes the kind of mechanics that these things undergo as classical now the other aspect is the quantum where particles that are very small microscopic uh, scopic particles are talked about in phases as well. So you talk about movement of electrons, okay? Movement of muons, movement of quarks, and so on and so forth. These are supposed to be in the quantum world. So there are uh, those we can talk of as classical phases and those that we can talk of as quantum phases. So Nebo, okay, is saying that his first assumption violates the principles of classical me mechanics. The first assumption was that if you look at the atom, then the hydrogen in the atom travels around the nucleus in a circular orbit. Okay? It travels in a circular orbit. Now, when substances are traveling in a circular you know, orbit, they are supposed to be losing some energy. As you travel, you lose energy. Because even if it's a car, and the car continues to go around the orbit in that manner, it will certainly use some fuel, and at the end of the day, it will finish. Now, given the electron, if the electron is moving in that orbit, moving in that orbit, and then loses energy, it means it's going to fall into the nucleus. And that is what um, how do you call it? Uh, Bohr did not find, he didn't find the electrons crashing into the nucleus of the atom, as will be the case of in classical physics. And so we are saying that Nebohr says the first assumption violates the principle of classical mechanics. But you know, he knew that it was impossible to explain the spectrum of the hydrogen atom within the limits of classical phases. Why? Because the hydrogen atom, we're looking at microscopic objects, and if you compare this to the classical world, I mean, it doesn't hold. And so, this was one of the things that caught the eye of most scientists along, around the time. He was therefore willing to assume that one or more of the principles from classical phases might not be valid on the atomic scale, okay? And so, according to Bohr, hydrogen atoms absorb light when an electron is excited from a low energy into a higher energy orbit. That's maybe from N1 to N3 or N1 to N4 or whatever. Again, atoms have been excited by electric discharge, okay, um, and can give off light when an electron draws from a higher energy to a lower energy. So you can excite an 
you know, atom, such that electrons can fall from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. The same excitation can be done for the atom at the lower energy level to go to a higher one. So basically, there can be a fall or a rise, okay? Again, the energy of the photon absorbed or emitted when the electrons move from one orbit to another is equal to the difference in the energy. So that's what we have explained using this equation. So E is equal to E1 minus E3. And I'm saying E1 should be the final, and then E3 is the initial you know, destination. And that is very, very important. Now, secondly, only limited number of orbits in which the electron can reside, okay, according to Nebel. Electrons can reside in only limited number of orbits. He based this assumption on the fact that there are only a limited number of lines in the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, and that is very, very important. The lines were the result of light being emitted or absorbed as an electron moves from one orbit to the other. And this has also been explained. Bohr restricted the number of orbits on the hydrogen atom by limiting the allowed values of the angular momentum of the electron. I explained this earlier. So according to Bohr, any object that is moving, and this has been explained, moving in a straight line, is supposed to have a linear momentum, which is mv. So if you are moving in a straight line, straight line, you have a linear momentum of mv. And moving in a circular path, you have an angular momentum Because you are moving in a circular path, you have an angular momentum, which is the linear momentum multiplied by the radius of the circle or the orbit in which you move. So we must take note of this, that the angular momentum is MVR and the linear momentum is M V. Thus, we can confidently write from our assumptions that M V R the electrons, you know, they are in orbit. So they will have an angular momentum. This M V R is the integral multiples of the Planck's constant. The Planck's constant divided by 2. And here, we add the pi to it. So this is simply the same as the angular momentum of the electron. NH over 2 pi is equal to the angular momentum of the electron in the orbit. I know n takes values of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to the number of orbits that you have. Maybe up to this point, somebody would want to find out why we have to know maybe the angular momentum of an electron. Okay, at a particular maybe orbit. Okay, it's also going to tell you because momentum has to do with the speed and the velocity, right? Speed and velocity. So if you look at the way the formula has been written, then it tells you that when you have higher energy, 
level. That's when n is, let's say, 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, then the momentum of that particle will be higher and vice versa. So if you have a lower energy level, then the momentum is supposed to be lower as well. Bohr used classical physics to show that the energy of an electron in any one of these orbits is inversely proportional to the square of the integer n. So again, Bohr said the energy of the electron that is in the orbit is inversely proportional to the square of the integer n. The integer n we know stands for the orbit or the energy level. And so this is very, very important in our discussion. So far, I think we've gotten ourselves about four or five formulas. First, we saw that, and remember, we saw that the energy can be proportional to the distance. That's if you are far away from the orbit or the nucleus, you have higher energy. And if you are closer to the nucleus, you have a smaller energy. That is one. Number two, we saw that the linear momentum L is supposed to be that's P is supposed to be MV. And we also saw that that angular momentum, because the electrons are in orbit, angular momentum L will be MVR. And we also saying that this angular momentum MVR is equal to the integral multiple of the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. This is also very, very important. And I think the last one here, so this is the fourth one. The last one that we just mentioned has to do with the fact that the energy E is also proportional to one out of that integer squared. And so five formulas or five relationships that we have so far. Don't forget that earlier on, we put up an equation which suggests that the energy of a photon is given by H nu h nu, where nu is the uh, frequency. Okay, some use V to represent, but this is the energy of the photon. And so this E here is the same as the h nu, which we shall look at in future. Now, the difference between the energies of any two orbits is therefore given by the following equation. So if E is inversely proportional to 1 over n squared, then if I have this atom whose nucleus is this, the first shell or first orbit, second orbit, third orbit, this is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. If I have this, the difference between the energy level as specified by Nebor, based on this formula that we have mentioned, E will be equal to some constant, because we have to remove the proportional sign there, I introduce a constant. That constant is R, which we shall call the Rebeck's constant, Rebeck, 
constant. So R into brackets, 1 over N squared minus 1 over N squared. Now, there are two Ns here. One of them should be final. The other one should be initial. So I could say this is final, and this one is initial. So this is how to determine the difference in energy when an electron should move from, let's say, energy level one to energy level two or three, or from three to one, and either falling or rising. And you should be able to do calculations on this once it is given to you. Um, by the time we end this lesson, I would expect most of you to have a very good insight into how to calculate this and to provide an answer when given. You must get your calculators because with this ones, you're going to get figures that you know, have powers. And if your calculators are not good, you'll not be able to uh, solve some of these problems that will come your way. Now, Ball was able to show that the wavelength in the UV, UV is ultraviolet, okay, spectrum of the hydrogen discovered by Lehman correspond to transitions from one of the higher energy orbits to n equals one. So let's look at something here. We are saying that this N3 has a higher energy level. This follows and this follows. Now one scientist by name Lee or Lehman, okay? Lehman discovered that when an electron drops from a higher energy level to energy level one. So it could be that there are six orbits, okay? So six energy levels, n equals six. So that thing drops from n equals six to n equals one, or n equals five to n equals one, or n equals four to n equals one, or n equals three to n equals one, or n equals 2 to n equals 1, then we'll call this the Lehman series. It's called what? Lehman series. So Lehman series is when an electron falls from an outer shell with a higher energy to the lowest of the shell or orbit, n equals 1. And I'm saying that this can be from N6 to N1, N5 to N1, N4 to N1, N3 to N1, N2 to N1. And we call it what? The Lehman series. Now, the radiations that emanate as a result of the electron falling from the higher energy level to the lower energy level is in the ultraviolet you know, spectrum, okay? Ultraviolet spectrum, very high energy spectrum. So anytime you are able to, and this can be, in fact, designed to produce weapons like the atomic bombs and all those things that you think about. You release an electron from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And then that lower energy level is supposed to be the first energy level, N equals one. And we describe this as what? The Lehman series. Now, when it falls from, let's say, a higher energy level to n equals 2, okay? So let's say from 3 to 2. Or there's a, a fourth shell. So 4, n equals 4 to 2, or n equals 5 to 2. I mean, in that order, then you call it the Bauman series. So we have Lehman series the Bauman series, and many others like the Passion series, the Bracket series, and then the Pufan series. All these are just telling us what happens when the atom falls from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. So in your chart, as you see on your screen, that the wavelength in the visible spectrum of hydrogen analyzed by Bauman are the results of transition from one of the higher energy orbits into n equals two. 
So Obama series, higher energy level to N equals 2. Remember Lima, N equals higher to N equals 1. Then we have the Passion series, the Bracket series, the Pufan series, all are in the infrared spectrum of hydrogen. So low energy, actually, if you look at, you compare the energy of the ultraviolet and infrared, then you know that the ultraviolet rays have higher energies than the infrared. And so perhaps bombs that may be created using the infrared spectrum will not be as powerful as that of the ultraviolet. And so we are looking at about four or five series from the hydrogen atom alone, the Lehman series, the Bauman series, the Passion series, the Bracket series, and then the Pufan series. This you must know. The Bohr model did an excellent job of explaining the spectrum of a hydrogen atom, okay, by incorporating a z squared term into the equation, and we'll bring it in when we want to look at the Bohr radius and all those things which adjusted for the increase in the attraction between an electron and the nucleus. You know, we have this, uh, you know, um, electro, uh, chemical, uh, adequate, uh, electrostatic force of attraction existing between the nucleus of this atom and all the electrons that move around it. So, Bohr, try to use his model of the atom to explain the hydrogen atom, I mean the spectrum in the hydrogen atom, by incorporating a Z square term. Z square here, Z will represent the atomic number, okay? And this was done excellently. So his model of the atom was able to explain the helium ion, the lithium ion, and then the beryllium ion. Now look at what is happening here. If you take hydrogen, the atomic number we know is one. Helium has atomic number two. Lithium has atomic number three. And beryllium has atomic number four. So for all these three atoms to resemble hydrogen atom, it means that each of these would have to lose their electron, so they will be left with one electron. And so if you look at that of helium, helium will lose one. That's why it becomes He plus. When you lose one, He plus. Now lithium, to become one, will have to lose two. So it means that we have Li2 plus. And beryllium, to resemble hydrogen, must also lose three. And so it becomes Be3 plus. So Be3 plus, Li2 plus, and He plus, they resemble or they are just like the hydrogen atom. And that's what's the boss model of the atom can explain. Apart from that, it cannot explain any other you know, atom. Okay, it can explain beryllium three plus, lithium three plus, uh, two plus, and a helium plus, and hydrogen itself. Any other atom beyond beryllium cannot be explained by the boss model. And that's where he also fell short, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, in terms of its model. So nothing could be done, however, to make this model fit the spectra of atoms with more than one electron. Okay? Nothing could be done. So deficiency of the Bohr model, simply why there are only a limited number of orbits in which the electron can reside in, in an atom is an issue. And why can't this model be extended to many electron atoms is also an issue which needs to be dealt with. Now, we want to look at the hydrogen spectrum or the spectra, you know, properly. Okay? And this has to do with the series that I talked about, the Lehman series, the Baron series, the Passion series, 
the bracket series and then the Pufan series. We want to see how the electrons will draw from higher level to you know, their final destination. Hence, the names that we have given to those spectral lines. And so let's go to our video and look at this and come back. Lehman series, Bauman series, Passion series, Bracket series, Buffon series, video roll. Yeah, so I believe we all saw in the video how this series come about, okay? How they come about. So when I mention Lehman series, you should be able to tell me that the electron is falling from a higher energy level to energy level one. If I mention the Bauman series, you should be able to tell me that electron has fallen from a high energy level to energy level two. If I also ask about the passion series, then you should be able to tell me that it has fallen from a high energy level to energy level three, bracket to energy level four, then the Pufan to energy level five. These are very, very, very important and We'll be looking at how to use all of these things for the calculation. In any case, this is our formula. Okay, this is the formula. So, the energy that is related to the Lehman series, Lehman, Lehman series, can be calculated by first knowing where the electron was, okay, the initial points, and then where it fell. So in this case, it fell to N to, to N1, and then it was from maybe either N2, N3, N4, N5, N6, or whatever. And then when you calculate the difference, then you get the Lehman series energy. If you want it for the Bauman series is the same formula where we have the E. So E Bauman will be equal to some R, which is a Rebex constant uh, to be given to you. 1 over N squared minus 1 over N squared. And we are saying 
this n is supposed to be the final, and this is supposed to be the initial. So for Bauman series, we know that the final destination n should be equal to 2. OK? The final destination n is 2, so this one will be 2. But then that electron could have come from n equals 3, or n equals 4, n equals 5, n equals 6, and so on and so forth. And then you can calculate that energy release as a result of the Bama series. And we know that these things, the Bama falls in the, you know, the infrared zone. So, ladies and gentlemen, before we say bye-bye to ourselves, let us remember we have been able to you know, put forward the assumptions made by Nebo, six of them. We said out of the six, three of them are of very much important to us because they actually, some of them contradicted you know, classical physics. We also saw you know, some formulas along the line which we have indicated and we'll be using these ones um, uh, pretty soon. Then finally, we saw the hydrogen spectrum with the spectral lines ranging from Lehman series to the uh, Pufan series. In our next lecture, we'll be looking at the Bohr's radius or the Bohr radius. Okay, we'll be calculating the Bohr radius and also do other things there. Um, as an assignment, you are supposed to look at the definition of the series that we find in the bracket, Pufan's and then Passion series. Define them. Then what are the assumptions made by Nerbor? You should be able to give the answers there. Draw the Nerbor model of the atom, okay? And then what are the limitations of the Nerbor model of the atom? We are still in the COVID season. We are advising you to go by the protocols put forward by our government and also by the World Health Organization. We need all of you in one piece and not in pieces. Enjoy the rest of the day and bye for now. <laughs>